Okay. Okay. Um, welcome to the first um, meeting of our Vermont Legislative Tourism Caucus uh, here in 2022. It is Friday, January 7th, and today we're going to be talking about. Okay. Um, welcome oh, to the my apologies. First, um, meeting of our Vermont Legislative. Sorry, can you hear me now? Everybody? Okay, my apologies. Um, so welcome again. Uh, we're gonna be talking today about uh, creative futures and we have a great list of guests here. In addition to our guests, I wanna make sure we are aware that the Secretary of the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, Lindsay Curley is here. Thank you, Lindsay. The Commissioner of the Department of uh, Economic Development, Joan Goldstein is here. Um, and the Commissioner of the uh, Vermont Department of Tourism, Heather Pelham is here all knowing how important this is uh, to all of us here in Vermont. So we appreciate you being here and, uh, and we'll obviously talk probably quite a bit about this in the future as well. But I'm gonna pass this off to our vice chair, representative Jerome from Brandon, who has been the lead on this issue and uh, has a bill that she plans to introduce this year uh, uh, pretty soon to, to get us, uh, to get us uh, rolling on it. So uh, Stephanie, I'm gonna pass this off to you. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Um, and good morning, everybody. Oh, it's... you're muted, Stephanie. Oh, really? Oh, no, you're not. Should I start again? Can you hear me now? Well, good morning. Um, it's certainly great to see everybody again. And I want to thank you for coming out this morning to hear about the importance of the arts economic sector in Vermont. I've been working on a bill and which would provide grants and incentives to boost Vermont's creative sector using ARPA funds. Uh, we have seen how the COVID pandemic has negatively impacted this important part of Vermont's economy. We know that the creative sector, uh, the creative businesses, performing arts venues and cultural organizations drive economic growth and build stronger communities throughout the state. The pandemic, has jeopardized the economic viability of the arts throughout Vermont. During the pandemic, cultural organizations were the first to close and perhaps still are the last to fully reopen. Now, last session, we did provide support to, these, uh, to many of these cultural organizations, but the financial picture of Vermont's uh, arts and performing arts venues and cultural organizations continues to be stressed. The Vermont Creative Futures Act proposes a recovery package that will help cultural and arts organizations weather the financial instability caused by COVID-19 and get them on sound financial footing again. So the importance of arts in small and uh, large towns throughout Vermont is evidenced um, in my own small town of just 4,000 people, where we have two performing arts venues, a for-profit and non-profit, a new opera house, and a cooperative artist gallery. And in addition, there are a multitude of independent artist studios scattered throughout the region. So um, I would like to uh, now turn this, uh, this morning's uh, talk over to Karen Middleman, who is one of the experts of on the arts in Vermont as she is the executive director of the Vermont Arts Council. Thanks. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And thank you all for having us this morning to talk about our bill. I really welcome this opportunity to talk to you about how hard the creative sector has been hit and what we can do um, to support it. I think we're gonna start by hearing from Mark Foley in Rutland, giving his perspective on the importance of the creative sector in downtown Rutland. So Mark, I'm gonna turn things over to you. Thanks, can Karen. I, I'm sorry, Mark, can I just interrupt? I see a 3795439. I'm just wondering if that's Jody Freed and we, uh, you had indicated- No, you it's, to me, it's, Mar it's Mary Morris. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Mark. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Secretary Curley, Commissioners Goldstein and Pelham, uh, Madam Chair and Vice Chair and all representatives, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, this morning, I'm gonna to talk to you about the importance of performing arts and public art here in Rutland. Uh, first, you might ask why a guy who runs a linen and uniform rental business is here talking to you about the importance of this culture and art and community identity, economic development and tourism. Um, 
So background, I'm a fourth generation Rutlander. And I've served on the board of the Paramount Theater for over 10 years, and I've been supporting and promoting public art initiatives in Rutland over that same time. And I also happen to own several uh, commercial buildings in our beautiful and historic downtown, which is why I've been involved with many partners over this last decade or so on these initiatives. And, and for full transparency, I'm also, I also serve on the board of the Vermont House Council. <laughs> so um, first, I want to talk about the Paramount. And the Paramount is starting an ambitious expansion this year, adding a new venue for both performances and community engagement. And here are some important statistics for you to consider. Um, prior to the pandemic, 65,000 patrons annually through the door over the next five years, uh, increasing that number to 85 to 90,000 people through the doors. 1.8 million in estimated annual impact, um, which will grow to 2.5 to $2.7 million in estimated impact. Um, 175 average number of events um, in pre-pandemic 2019 expected to grow to 300 average performances per year, uh, which is nearly one a day um, for, for our community. Uh, the Paramount is truly an economic driver here in Rutland in our region. And, and a couple of statistics for the tourism folks, 42% um, of our patrons come from outside Rutland County, 15% of them out of the state. Um, and 58% within the county. So those are important statistics. And those numbers have really skewed further and further out of our region over the last five years. So that those numbers are growing, uh, serving outside of our region. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about public art. Um, 10 years ago, there was very little public art uh, in Rutland. Now it's a foundational strategy for attracting new business and visitors to Rutland's downtown. A growing list of murals, nearly 20, and marble sculptures, nine with another six already committed has transformed the streetscape and walkability of our community in a coordinated effort with our local chamber and downtown groups who have created online maps and apps for these we routine, we routinely now see families and other visitors going from piece to piece taking photos with and enjoying this incredible art local restaurants and shops have seen significant increases in day traffic over the last two years and credit this public art as a primary driver Partnerships with organizations like the Carving Studio, Green Mountain Power, and multiple local muralists and artists have made this possible. And lastly, I want to talk about a volunteer group called 77 Art, which has brought artist residencies to Rutland over the last three years, and with it over 100 participants, all from out of state, some international, that immerses them into our community for four weeks at a time, helping artists better understand rural Vermont and our community better understand them. We've also been hosting pop-up galleries for years um, in our in our city, and it has made a credible impact um, not only on the psyche and and uh, uh, community spirit of of Rutland, but also in those that visit our community. Um, so I want to thank you again for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. I strongly encourage you to consider robust funding for the arts and culture sector of Vermont, and and thank you all for your service to our communities in the state. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. And I don't think I've told you, but I'll share with everyone. When I was looking for a COVID safe activity to do with my sister who was visiting from New York, we went, we met in Rutland and we did the sculpture trail in the freezing cold weather um, and, and huddled outside and sipped uh, coffee and tea. And we had such a marvelous time. I think you all know that if you walk around downtown Rutland or Stowe or Brandon or almost any of our towns, you can feel the presence of arts and culture. It makes our towns alive. Um, so thank you, Mark. Um, and to talk a little bit more about that downtown perspective, I'm gonna turn things over to Gary. And I'm keeping an eye, Gary. I may interrupt you if Jody pops on, okay? But I'm gonna turn things over to Gary Holloway, who I'm pretty sure you all know. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks so much for, for having us here this morning. Um, my name is Gary Holloway. I'm the downtown program manager at the Department of Housing and Community Development. I have the, the privilege of working with uh, amazing people across Vermont and amazing communities. Um, um, I'm here today to kind of speak about the importance of arts uh, in the creative sector in our downtowns. I, you know, I think it goes without saying, but and you know, the creative sector is really the fabric um, of our downtowns. Um, it's, it's what makes Vermont unique. Um, I, I think I can speak both to, you know, Vermonters living here and the quality of life that we have because of the arts and culture organizations and, and businesses uh, that we so much appreciate as residents here um, is also the very reason why people consider moving to Vermont um, or visiting Vermont. Um, because it's not like everywhere else USA. 
Um, they come to Vermont and they expect to have an experience. Uh, and we don't disappoint uh, because they can, they can go to uh, performing arts centers. Uh, they can walk downtown and see the beautiful, you know, locally crafted um, um, goods that are in our, in, in our galleries and in our shops, in our downtowns. Um, so I think it, it's so important that we have this, um, that, we, that we support the creative sector um, so that we can continue to set Vermont apart from everywhere else, USA. I want to share just a few, you know, a few examples of some places around Vermont that um, are real treasures um, and provide these types of experience for, for both Vermonters and, and our visitors. Um, you know, as you all know, you know, we have some of the bigger, bigger communities that have um, large performing arts centers, like in Montpelier, we have the Lost Nation Theater. You know, unbelievable, a place like that can host 125, you know, performing arts events a year in, in normal times. Um, we have one of the last, um, you know, kind of independent movie theaters in the Savoy, which often partners with these larger festivals like the Green Mountain Film Festival that brings together really talented international filmmakers um, that provide an opportunity for visitors and, and locals alike to see these amazing independent films. Um, places like Randolph that have the Chandler Center for the Arts is a draw for that entire region. Um, in Randolph. Um, we have in Middlebury, we have the Town Hall Theater, uh, which has been there for, for many, many years and um, really engages with, um, with the school and with locals and, um, and, and talented performers, um, constantly looking to pivot during these COVID times. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we um, were really impressed with. Um, to kind of see the, the tenacity of these organizations to come together. Um, in good times, they are struggling to, you know, to keep the lights on and to keep the volunteers um, that they have um, um, to operate these things. And they've been able to pivot and do some really creative things. And I want to share a couple examples of how Gary? they can, Yeah. Is Jody here? This is, Gary, this is a perfect moment. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but Jody's just joined us. Please. And talk about yeah. an organization that has pivoted and done an incredible work during the pandemic. Catamount Arts, with jo which Jody Fried heads, right. is really, uh, I think, just the star in that regard. So I'm gonna turn things over to Jody. We'll come back and circle back to you, Gary, after Jody's okay. done, if that's okay. Oh, absolutely. Take it away, Jody. Hi, everyone, and, and sorry to butt in there, Gary. <laughs> I mean to cut you off, my friend. Um, I appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity. I'm, I'm right now with the Vermont Leadership Institute in the middle of a session. So I stepped away from the cohort uh, that I'm facilitating and, and just wanted to share with you a few reflections. You know, since we've started the pandemic, um, there's been this uh, in, incredible pressure on all of the organizations, uh, for-profit, non-profit um, across the state. Um, and, as it relates to the ambiguity. And, and this isn't unique to the creative sector. Um, of course, it's across all of our different industries, but I think it's really important that everybody understands that um, the impact on the creative sector has been tremendous as well. Um, and I just wanted to share with you a couple of examples of, of how that's manifesting itself with our organization to give you some tangibles to, to, to take into these conversations. So. Um, as we've tried to turn the, the lights back on, so to speak, we, we actually closed our doors to the public for 463 days. Um, we, we geared back up this summer, we did 53 outside events, and then we went into producing uh, larger indoor events over the course of the fall with our KCP Presents series and other indoor programming. We've on average been at about 40% capacity um, for those events. So about 40% of ticket sales. And our costs are running about 30% higher. Um, it's costing more in terms of marketing to get folks there. It costs more in terms of PPE um, and the safety protocols. And so it's very, very expensive um, to, to, to run these events. And then you're dealing with the unknown as to in terms of epidemiology and whether a spike is gonna throw you off. And we just had this happen over the holidays. Some of you may have seen what happened, but on the Thursday before Christmas, um, we had a phone conversation with our healthcare and our education partners in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, and we regularly check in with them. There's a bond there of trust and collaboration that is key in that they know that we are critical for their workforce development efforts and for their ability to thrive 
Um, and so they, they support us at all levels in what we do, but there's an understanding that if at any point they need our help or need us to respond, that we will immediately. And that phone call came right before um, Christmas on Thursday as it related to First Night, which for us is an event that's been around for 30 years. It's over 200 artists, 15 venues, and it takes an entire year to work on it. Um, and we invested all of that. Um, we had been checking in regularly with the healthcare providers to make sure that we were in a position where we could safely manage that event. And yet, with all of that being said, we got to the point with seven days before the event, we got the phone call that in the Northeast Kingdom, we were at critical capacity in our emergency rooms and that basically things had moved to red and that we needed to react. And we immediately pulled the emergency break on the event and had to pivot, um, went to an all free event, um, canceled all 50 in-person performances across all venues. We ended up paying all of those artists to perform virtually in a free format, and we streamed 40 of those 50 events, uh, and it still ended up being an a important community event for us, um, but I think you could understand what that meant to us financially uh, and what that meant in terms of um, the, the operational impact. So it's a really good example of what we've been facing in this sector now for a long time now, for two years. And as we move forward, are gonna to continue to face this. And so there was a lot of funding that got us to this point, and we are so grateful for everybody who's been involved with that. But I think that we all need to understand that in order for organizations to be able to move forward, there's gonna to need to be additional um, support there to be able to deal with this ambiguity and the reality of getting back to whatever the new normal is um, at, at the end of the pandemic. And I'll just end by saying that I know workforce is at a very top of the list for everybody right now in the Northeast Kingdom it is. Um, and I, there is in my mind, and, and you guys have heard me say this many years over and over again, long long before there was a pandemic or this was, we, we, read, we read the writing on the wall in terms of the demographics in the Northeast Kingdom, but the workforce issues a critical piece of the solution is going to be a vibrant creative sector because younger workers require it. And if you look at the information from the Governor's Association, if you look at the research and the data, young workforce are going to gravitate towards rural communities that have vibrant, strong creative sector. And without that, we're not going to address the workforce problems in the state of Vermont. I appreciate your time today, and I'm going to go back to the VLI cohort of 2022 and do some leadership training. Thanks so much, Jody. If it's okay, we'll turn things back to Gary. Great. Thank you. Um, I'll always appreciate what Catamount Arts um, and Jody Freed, um, the powerful force he is, um, is doing in the Northeast Kingdom. It's just remarkable. Um, one of the things he, he kind of triggered my head on, and I was going to touch on, I'm going to touch on a couple examples of some other um, events similar to what um, Jody was speaking to in St. Johnsbury. I think one of the things we need to keep in mind is that, you know, the, the creative sector really is a, is a driving economic um, force. Um, and if you think about, you know, a singular event that may happen over the course of, you know, a few weekends or even, even a single event, you think about, um, all of the artists who are being paid, all the musicians, um, the food trucks or, or catering caterers that are being paid uh, to, to make that event happen. Um, if, it, if they didn't happen, think about the livelihoods of all the folks that, um, that are involved with these types of um, activities in our communities where they would be. And so I think, you know, sometimes we, I think, enjoy, enjoy as spectators, um, you know, everything that <laughs> that those types of events have to offer, but we don't often think about the importance of the actual economics behind those events and, and the restaurants and the, and, the, and the shops that are that are nearby that are also benefiting or the lodging. Um, so I think that's a really important piece of all this is that it all, is all ties into kind of the economics of our community that we, that we bring in this vibrancy uh, to support those other, you know, to support the artists, support the businesses. Um, I want to share just, I know I probably only have another minute or two, but I wanted to give a couple um, other great examples of some events that um, some of which may have been planned for and others which which have had to pivot uh, during uh, during COVID. 
uh, in Springfield, uh, they recently, in the past few years, uh, um, expanded this beautiful park right along the Black River uh, in downtown Springfield. Uh, and they, they started to program um, different events in the park. And through a recent, um, you know, Better Places uh, grant that they received um, through our agency, they were able to make some enhancements to that park to be able to accommodate the types of events that they wanted to have. So they, they this past summer, they did a um, like a Friday night music series that uh, brought together local artists, dance performers. Um, they had uh, the ability to do a fundraiser, uh, fundraising event that raised money for um, for uh, low-income um, um, folks in the in the area that want to take dance classes, that want to participate, uh, but didn't have an opportunity to. So it became this real, like, community-centered event that brought everyone together in this safe gathering space uh, to enjoy each other, but also to be able to uh, provide a greater benefit by having, you know, fundraisers for the community. Um, there's other there's other events, and I want to highlight this one in White River Junction um, as a you know, as you all know, White River Junction has become this kind of mecca for uh, for for creative arts with their with uh, Northern Stage and with um, um, the Center for Cartoon Studies there. And there's a lot of independent filmmakers um, and they brought together what they called Light River, Light River Junction, uh, which was also this kind of COVID safe event that closed down the streets in White River Junction. And uh, they were showing films on storefronts. They were um, um, uh, there was uh, independent movies. There was uh, um, local artists and food trucks that came uh, that came downtown and really just brought people from that greater kind of Upper Valley region into White River Junction and had a really significant economic impact and just really just for the well being mentally of I think the region to be able to come together in a in a safe space to um, you know to appreciate. So I think I'll, I'll stop there. I've, I've probably burned my five minutes, but I can't say enough, um, you know, about the importance of us supporting um, what's being presented here from the Vermont Arts Council and really appreciate everything the Arts Council has done in terms of their leadership role to kind of ensure that we are staying on the right track and supporting what we believe to be, you know, important assets for our communities here in Vermont. So thank you for, for listening to me and, and having me. Thank you so much, Gary. And is it okay if we share the slides and I will take it away at this point? I will. I know that some of you have to jump off the call. I will move very quickly through the key elements of our bill and then we would love to hear your questions. Patty, I have it right here if you want me to just share it. Okay. So while the slides are loading, I'll just say again, thank you so much for having me. And we appreciate everything that the legislature and all of you have done to support the arts and the creative sector so far. So thank you. So we've been looking at data for years since before the pandemic, showing that especially in small rural states like Vermont, the creative sector is key to our economic development and really to the economic future of, of small towns and rural areas um, like ours. It provides jobs, it anchors our downtowns, all of, the, all of the wonderful examples that you've just heard demonstrate how important the creative economy is to, to Vermont and to our downtowns. That was before the pandemic. Then the pandemic hit and that entire foundation was shaken. So as you see on the screen, we have some statistics from the very early months of the pandemic in 2020. The creative sector in the first few months, just from April to July of 2020, lost 8,090 jobs and more than 216 million in lost sales revenue due to the impact of COVID. Now fast forward to the summer of 2021, and we have a snapshot of economic losses from a sample of 197 cultural organizations that applied for our cultural relief grants. And together they reported $36 million in losses. And let's go to the next slide, thanks. So as, as Heidi said, when she opened our organizations, our cultural organizations were among the first to close at, to protect public health and among the last to reopen. And so many of them are still struggling. I don't have to tell you that that has an impact beyond a single organization. When a summer theater festival is canceled or an entire 
um, craft fair closes or a, a jazz fest is postponed, that is an impact beyond a single arts organization. It means that the audiences that that, that arts organization was depending on just disappear. And that means lost revenue, lost energy. The entire town loses that infusion of energy and social connection and dollars that they were relying on. Now, relief from federal and state funds last year was incredibly essential. It was a lifeline. I know many of our arts organizations wouldn't have survived without it, so thank you. We know it kept, it kept many of our creative businesses and arts organizations afloat. And yet we know that the need continues. Omicron has brought a whole new wave of uncertainty and challenges for organizations that were just beginning to rebound. Our bill is designed to get those creative businesses and cultural organizations to the other side, to help them reboot, re restart programming and re-engage their audiences. So let's go to the next slide and I'll walk you very quickly through the bill. Next. Yeah, that, Sorry, that slide's yeah. perfect, thank you. Oh. Yeah, no, that one's great. That, that I'll walk one. you really quickly through the bill. This one's great. Oh, now let's go, well, go back to the one that says creative economy grants that you were on. That's perfect, thank you. So $10 million in creative economy grants would cover a portion of fixed monthly operating expenses for organizations and creative businesses that have sustained revenue losses. Those are the fixed costs that don't go away just because you close your doors. So mortgage, rent, utilities, insurance, security, property maintenance, all of those costs that organizations and businesses continue to bear, even when they have no revenue coming in from ticket sales or, or other forms of revenue. $4 million would support facility adaptations to make museums, galleries, and theaters able to open COVID safely. And $2 million would help with the cost of implementing COVID safe public programming. And you see in the blue bar on your screen, some examples of the kinds of costs that we, we are hearing um, are putting an added burden on our organizations right now. In order to welcome audiences back, theaters and museums are having to invest in hiring more frontline staff so they can do vaccine checks at the door. Uh, in, they're investing in deep cleaning between events Many of them are supplying masks and hand sanitizer for performers, for crew, for their own employees and for public audiences. And um, I probably don't have to tell many of you that tents are, tent rentals are among the most uh, burdensome and, and prohibitive costs for having safe outdoor events. And the next slide, please. $750,000 would be invested in creative spaces grants. These are envisioned as ways to restore vitality to downtown spaces, vacant retail and office spaces. Um, we, these grants would allow a creative business to rent a space at below market rate that is affordable for them and that would otherwise not be generating any income for the landlord. The grant would cover insurance for the property and would also give the landlord a portion of, of income somewhere between a half to three quarters of a typical rental. And it would allow that artist or creative business to find its footing while at the same time bringing that space to life, for example, as a studio, as a pop-up art gallery, or as an exhibition space. Next slide, please. $500,000 would support marketing of arts and culture events and venues and businesses to help stimulate consumer spending and business recovery. And finally, 250,000 would sustain the work of the Vermont Creative Network. I think most of you know the network was established in 2015 and 2016 with seed, with seed funds from the legislature. It serves as a hub for research, networking, fundraising, and support for Vermont's entire creative sector. And these funds would allow us to hire a coordinator and would also support our local grassroots leadership across the state. And next slide, please. Here's why we believe that investment in the creative sector is essential for all the reasons that you've just heard. Arts and culture are part of the DNA of our, of our state. They are what drive economic growth, what make our towns wonderful places to live and also attract tourists. I'll skip quickly over this because you've heard wonderful examples from others um, that make all these points. Let's go to the final slide. Thank you. So in terms of tourism, the creative sector, as you know, is a key reason why tourists come to Vermont. We're known in the region for our film festivals, our music festivals, our dance and theater performances, 
are artisan shops, craft fairs, and galleries. The majority of people from other states who attend a cultural event here say that that event was their primary reason for coming to our state. And every dollar that's spent on a ticket to a cultural event generates additional revenue, as you've already heard. In 2016, event-related spending by arts and culture audiences in Vermont totaled $44 million. That means that every dollar we spend right now to strengthen the creative sector is really an investment in Vermont's recovery. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, we've thrown a lot of, uh, of ideas at you and I would love to hear your questions and your thoughts. And thank you again for having us. Okay, uh, thank you very much to uh, all of you and Karen for the um, for the slides. Um, I guess I'd, I'd like to just have uh, maybe Stephanie talk a little bit about, um, Stephanie, if you could, because I sent the bill draft to everybody. Um, it didn't seem as though the slide deck actually um, talked about all of the money that's going to it. So just how would it, how are we, this is, we're talking about the Creative Futures Bill that Stephanie Jerome has introduced, and she's put it together with uh, the help of many of these stakeholders that have just spoken. And so, um, could you just tell us a little bit more about the bill itself and, and how it might work? Um, that would be great. And, sure, and you so could pass it off to whomever too. I yeah, sure. So it's, a, it's asking for $17.5 million um, using ARPA funds. And um, then the, the bill's pretty, I think I've sent a bill out to the whole, to the whole group too. So there's grants, uh, there's, um, there's grants and incentives and, and to help all these, all these organizations. Perhaps Karen, you wanna go say a little bit more about that? Sure, so um, Heidi, did you have a question about one of the specific grant programs that I, no, that I ran I'm, through? I know I went through it quickly. No, I, I just I I didn't see that uh, 17 million was listed in the slide deck, the entire 17 million. So I'm really trying to understand Got how it. this would work. Does it go to the agency? Uh, does it go how who decides who can apply all of that kind of thing? How is it actually going to be? Okay. Uh, how do you do you envision that this is going to work? OK, so I, I'll, I'll go really quickly through it. So the $10 million, here's how the 17.5 breaks down. And then I'll, I can answer questions about the specific grant programs, if that works for you. So okay. $10 million yeah. goes for the um, creative economy grants. And those are for both cultural nonprofits and for for-profit creative businesses. And that's when I was talking about covering a portion of the fixed monthly costs for organizations. That's what that $10 million would cover. We're envisioning these working in a way very similar to the other COVID relief grants that the Arts Council has run. So we've run two different COVID relief grant programs, one with CARES Act funds and one with ARPA funds. And we also collaborated, as all of you know, with ACCD to give out the economic recovery grants. So we'd use a similar formula. We would ask organizations to, show, to demonstrate net losses. First of all, they would need to demonstrate net revenue losses in a six month period, comparing one year to another. And the best way that we've found to do that in our experience with ACCD is to actual, actually look at financial statements, p &L statements from those organizations, rather than relying on tax data. For, uh, especially for a cultural nonprofit, we'd be asking, we'd be looking at their, their monthly and annual financial statements, comparing a six month period and then once they demonstrate harm from the pandemic, net revenue losses, we'd make grants based on a percentage of um, operating budget. What we did with cultural, with the COVID relief and COVID recovery grants that we gave out with CARES Act and ARPA funds is we divided organizations by, by operating budget size. And we gave just as, as an example, organizations that had um, operating budget of up to $250,000, we gave them a fifth, uh, sorry, $5,000 grant. $250,000 to $750,000, we gave them grants of $10,000 and above $750,000, they received a grant of $15,000. This 10 million would be broken down in those same three categories, but we're anticipating grants ranging with a, with a wider spread, ranging from 10,000 at the lower end to 250,000 at the higher end. Does that help for that? That's the largest 
um, frankly, largest chunk of funding that we're requesting is for those creative economy grants, and that's how we're envisioning them. Um, then the smaller pieces uh, would be 4,000, and now I have to go look at my slide, sorry. Um, here we go, sorry. Uh, so then there would be 4 million and 2 million for the facility adaptation grants and the public programming adaptation grants. Those are specifically for cultural nonprofits, not for for-profit businesses. Those are for our theaters, museums, um, other, other creative businesses, historic sites that have sustained financial losses and that need to make adaptations so that they can be COVID safe. And that's where uh, the slide with the blue bar that gave you those examples of costs like hand sanitizer, masks, um, HVAC assessments, tent rentals, that's what those two buckets of funding would provide. And then the, the, final, um, the final two buckets would be the smaller allocations of $750,000 for the Creative Spaces grants to transform vacant office and retail spaces into spaces that are enlivened through the arts and that bring vitality down to downtowns. And the, um, the smaller allocation of 500,000 for state and regional marketing and 250,000 for the creative network coordinator. That all adds up to 17.5 million, um, if I've done my math correctly. So okay. does that help? Yeah, that's excellent. Uh, just one last question from me and then I'm gonna pass it on um, to other folks. I'm sure, start raising your hands if you have questions. Um, Karen, just one more question. Mm -hmm. All of this would be going, uh, if in you envision this going directly to the Vermont Arts Council and being applied for to uh, by these entities to the Vermont Arts Council and the Arts Council distributes it, or it would go through the agency to the Arts Council, or how, how does that? How so the way the bill is written, the, the legislature would be giving these funds to ACCD and they would subgrant to the Arts Council. Um, we are frankly million. happy to have the funds given out in any way that makes sense for the creative businesses and arts organizations. Um, we've partnered well with ACCD in the past and we stand ready to do that again in whatever way that makes sense. We just, we, we're really seeing ourselves as a conduit, as the state arts ag agency as, and as a funder, as a conduit to get these funds out to the field. Um, so we'd be happy to have it work either way through the Arts Council or in partnership with ACCD. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Representative Kalaki has a question. Thank you, well, it, it's more of a comment. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, you know, I think it was a great presentation. The one thing I would add I ran the Flynn Center for eight years, and it was a, a large organization, 1,400 seats in, in Burlington. And what wasn't mentioned is that places like the Flynn employed over 2,000 people a year. Our seven and a half million dollars, $2 million was for salaries. That's gone. There's 25 people at the Flynn right now. And these, the stagehands, which are union crew, are very skilled people. And they have not worked in 18 months because we do, aren't doing Broadway shows in our theaters right now. So as we look at workforce development, this is a really key industry. And we, and we heard a lot about community impact, but it's actually, if you look at the Brattleboro Museum, if you look at the Shelburne Museum, think about all the people that are employed, not just who are visiting and people are coming to see, but this in a workforce uh, crisis we have, this sector has been decimated. And you know, as we reopen, we hope that those skilled union workers are still around to come back because they have not had any work in our, in our state for 18 months. So it, it's key to understand Karen's numbers of 44,000 who are employed. Many of those are workers, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Well, and if I might jump in, I'm, her I, I'm so glad you mentioned that because I'm hearing from the Shelburne Museum from some of our, our, our larger venues that they can't hire back the people that they've lost. Many of them have left Vermont during the pandemic and their organizations are really struggling um, to just rehire their frontline staff. So that you're absolutely right. Great, uh, Representative Harrison. Yeah, thanks to Heidi. And thank you all for the presentation today. It was actually, uh, very helpful to put things in perspective, but um, at the risk of 
uh, getting ahead of ourselves um, and, and putting the administration on the spot. I'm wondering if Secretary Curley or <laughs> Commissioner Pelham can give us any insight as to whether or not it's likely to be um, incorporated in the uh, governor's budget coming up. And they may not be able to answer that. And I understand it's just wearing my appropriations hat. It's if it's not in one place, we've got to take it out of somewhere else uh, from their original plan. So um, Secretary Curley, please. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know. To be honest, um, I ha haven't even read through the details of the bill. I was a, you know aware, um, didn't know the dollar amount. So I, I we really aren't far enough along to for me to be able to answer that question to you. We absolutely agree uh, the importance of arts and culture in our communities. Um, so it's not an, an issue of that. It's just an issue of, uh, again, the, the dollar ask and, and sort of looking at everything that's on the table and, and figuring out where we go from there. But um, as I, I'm committed to, to us reading through the bill and figuring this out sooner rather than later, uh, Commissioner Pelham may have something to add and I don't wanna just hog the floor up. I would Heather. just reiterate that, I mean, this is crucial for the tourism sector that we support the arts and culture businesses in the state. So it's just a, you know, we'll get through the details. Um, and it's just really exciting that there's attention being paid to the sector. I think that's that's where we are at this moment. Great. Thank okay. you both so much. <laughs> yes, um, thank you. Thank you both. And again, I apologize for putting you on the spot, but <laughs> it's it's just helpful to know um, where it is coming out of the starting gate. Um, uh, okay, we so, get good thanks. at feeling, we, we're good at feeling uncomfortable. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> As are thank you, you. So, <laughs> it's all fine. Uh, Representative Campbell. Sure, thanks Heidi. So I'm just thinking of uh, the tourism angle here. Um, I'm, I've been on the Catamount Arts Board for, I don't know, 12 years or something. I'm actually uh, currently president and um, Jody's done a fa fabulous job, as you all know. Um, one of the things that we have done here in the last, I guess, four, four, four or five years is um, host a, a, a summer music series every Sunday afternoon uh, on Dog Mountain in St. Johnsbury. And boy, has that attracted people from out of state and, and from everywhere. It's just been fantastic. And so I just wanted to, to uh, remind everybody that this really is a tourism um, initiative. So thanks. Thank you, Scott. I, I do have, um, sorry, I don't see any other hands up. So I'm going to steal the, steal this again. I just, uh, this is a very, this is a relatively small amount of money in comparison to the whole bill, but I just have a question about the 500,000 marketing. And I just want to make clear, cause I, that was one of the uh, initial things I had, but I understand that the idea in this proposal is that is not actually coming out of the, I, this is all ARPA funds. So this would be in addition to any Vermont Department of Tourism and Marketing marketing funds. I just want to make try to make that clear because that's been a big issue for me throughout my years in the legislature is the mar tourism marketing. And I don't want to conflate to, I just want to make sure that's, I just want to make sure I'm clear that's above and beyond what whatever is we end up as legislators putting into the budget for uh, tourism and marketing funding. For marketing. That's yeah. correct. Um, and I will say that with that said, that we have enjoyed great collaborations with Heather and her team, and we're actually modeling this piece of the bill on the, the successful uh, restart marketing grants. Uh, okay. it, they would run in a very similar way, tailored specifically for arts and culture venues and for creative, creative sector businesses. So incentives like um, spending incentives like passports and gift cards, like the Brandon Bucks that were given out um, and uh, advertising campaigns, promotional events. I know that a lot of arts organizations and cultural nonprofits took advantage of those restart grants. The Vermont Crafts Council did. Um, the, a lot of downtowns had spending programs like the Brandon Bucks um, and Bennington did in Brattleboro and I'm sure other towns that don't start with B. Um, <laughs> 
uh, did as well. Uh, but I know that arts, art galleries, craft shops, and craft artists took advantage of all of those, and we see that as a great benefit. So it's model. We're modeling on our program on uh, that success successful one. Okay. Are there any other questions from anybody? Oh, yep. Uh, Representative Austin. Yes. Thank you. Um, I just want to say I totally have always supported the arts. I mean, I feel living in Vermont is like to me living in a painting. I mean, I can't drive anywhere in Vermont that it isn't honestly the most beautiful and emotionally stirring uh, event for me. But I think for me, what would be helpful is to kind of understand the investment that we would be making uh, with this funding in terms of, you know, revenues for Vermont, you know, just having some hard data to present in terms of um, tourism dollars, jobs, salaries, um, workforce development, businesses. I mean, just, uh, you know, I, I think there are a lot of us that just totally support the art, but I think there are others that may see it more as a kind of an extra or a fringe and might not understand how much uh, revenue it brings into Vermont and also bringing people uh, hopefully to come and stay here like myself um, because of what it has to offer. So that, that's just a suggestion. I did read through the bill and I'm not, I don't remember, I'm sorry, it was a while ago, you know, if that was included in terms of if we make this investment, this is what, uh, this is how it will result in revenues for Vermont. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Representative Kalaki. Uh, so I think if, if Karen, if you would send around your slide deck, we went through very quickly, but Sarita, some of those numbers that you're asking for are actually in that slide deck. And then Karen's agency also has an expanded version of the economic impact of the arts and the creative sector. So I think if we share that, I, I think you'll, you'll get the data you're looking for. It's not me. I don't, I know, you know, because I'm in this caucus, but I think for the rest of the legislature, um, sure. no, and the understood. Public, yep. I think yep. the public too needs to know how much uh, it is an economic driver yep. um, for Vermont. Karen or Patty, if you could send, I have the deck, so I'll, I'll make sure the Tourism Caucus gets uh, your presentation. But if you have the other document that, uh, that John is talking about, send it, send it to me, that'll be great. And I can get it to folks. Uh, I will well. be happy to do that. We just concluded a three-year research project demonstrating the economic impact of Vermont's creative sector. And I will send you um, both the executive summary and the long version for the truly interested. So we'll perfect. forward that. Thank you. That's perfect. Um, so, uh, so we don't have any other questions. I just want to, um, Stephanie, you are still, you're still open for more co-sponsors, right? For this, you haven't introduced it yet or submitted it yet. I'm right? at, no, I, I'm, I would like to submit it today. Um, okay. and I am open to, would love to have some more co-sponsors. A lot of the folks who are on this call, uh, today are sponsoring, but there's a few who haven't. So if you would like to like to sponsor it, I would love it if you if you, you would. Can put me on the, you can put me on that. I'll send you an email, but. Thank you, Heidi. I um, really appreciate that. And then, um, and then I'd love to sort of, maybe we can um, organize a sit down. I know uh, both the secretary and the commissioner, commissioners are, are, um, are busy with preparing budget, you know, for, uh, for uh, uh, 2023, but maybe we can organize a time to, Kind of sit down as a as a few of us to to talk with them about what their thoughts might be and and then move forward on it once it's introduced. Hopefully, do you anticipate this going to commerce or to appropriations? I I, I guess my my initial my knee jerk reaction was I would go to commerce, but um, maybe go right to appropriations. That would be terrific too. Well, then we'll count on you and and Jim Harrison if Jim is on appropriations, but you yeah. and Jim kind of being the the, the our uh, our liaisons for that then depending on where it goes okay yeah and I just want to also thank uh, Secretary Curley and um, Heather and and also Joan for attending today's uh, talk it means a lot that you have that interest in this really important topic we're glad you invited us 
<laughs> Happy yeah, to be thank here. You. Yeah, thank you both. Okay, well, that um, concludes our first uh, Tourism Caucus meeting. We'll be back, Stephanie and I will be back in touch with all of you. And thank you all. Thank you, Mark and Jody and uh, Karen and Patty and Gary uh, for joining us. And of course, as Stephanie said, the uh, Secretary and uh, Commission, uh, Secretary Curley and Commissioner Pelham and Commissioner Goldstein. So thank you all. And I will send out the uh, information I received. Thank you all very much for having us. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Take care.